hear it. Actually, a separate activity which happens to take place in parallel with our school. Um, and there will be two special lectures on a nanomechanics related topic today um, at the other building of ICTP. It's, uh, it's called the CMSP Special Lecture Series, Nanomechanics Meets Spintronics, and there will be talks by Robert Schechter and Leonid Gorelik this afternoon during our mini project time. So in case you're interested in the topic and you agree with your fellow team members that you might want to go to these talks and catch up on your mini project uh, during uh, some of the other mini project time, please feel free to attend. This is an extra opportunity if you're interested. Besides that, um, it's already posted outside. Hmm, it's not working. We will have a conference photograph taken tomorrow, unless the weather is too terrible. So um, we'll announce that again, but uh, keep in mind tomorrow uh, in the coffee break, there will be a conference picture. And for those of you who will stay for the second week um, in the workshop, I would just like to give you a very short peek at uh, what's going on there. We're going to have an excursion on Tuesday uh, to visit these beautiful caves, or, I mean, you can go to the cave and take a hike around if you don't want to go inside. There will be more information next week. Um, but so that's coming up on Tuesday. And on Wednesday, we're going to have yet again another event, an ICTP colloquium given by Florian Marquardt. Um, there will be more information next week. So back to this week, um, we were briefly outlining the lunch with the experts yesterday. And uh, we decided to, to write it up in, in the form of sort of one compact slide for, for everybody to, to catch up on that. As said yesterday, it's an opportunity to interact with the speakers, with the organizers in an informal way over lunch. The participants which are supported by the ICTP, so who had their local expenses or their travel supported, are obliged to attend these lunches. If there's a few empty seats at the table, the other participants are, of course, uh, invited as well. But uh, the, the supported participants um, have preference, and they have to be there. This means when we're done with the morning session, please proceed to lunch immediately, such that you won't spend half of the time uh, in, in a queue. And then uh, once you have your food, find the table with the sign, lunch with the experts, and, and join us. We're looking forward to talking to you. And finally, the mini projects. First question, have you found your team? And uh, I think Florian will uh, take over with the list in a minute. If you have not found your team and you don't know what to do, please contact us and, and we're happy to help you. So, I mean, as you saw in the schedule, there's plenty of uh, time to work on the mini projects. We'll be around if there's questions or need of discussion, but so, so this is essentially your time to do this together. The results of the mini projects will be presented mostly during the second week, during the workshop. There are some teams uh, we learned which are essentially gone next week. So if your team will be mostly home next week, please inform us, uh, let us know, and then we will assign your presentation at the end of this week. These presentations are intended to take about five minutes. So I, I, I would say roughly three slides um, to, to tell us what you did and what you came up with. OK. and. Um, so this is the team composition as, I mean, as far as we can tell. A few people have not arrived yet or have not signed the list. These are highlighted in red. A few didn't 
specify their team number on the piece of paper which we're sort of passing through yesterday. Um, you may want to fix that. And a few people have canceled, and so these are the names that, that are crossed out. So if you were missing these people, so you, you can stop worrying, these aren't actually here. Um, I think now I quickly end on. Okay, uh, just everyone, this is the list again that we uh, passed around yesterday. If you uh, have not yet signed, please sign there. Uh, even if you have signed but didn't insert your team number, please insert it. If you don't at all know your team, team number, just contact us and we can work it out and maybe assign you to some team or show you the uh, list of the topics again and you can be assigned to a team. Uh, thank you. So this list is important. And the uh, first lecture of today is uh, um, Oriol Romero Isa, who will actually give a blackboard lecture. Uh, and this has to do with the very interesting topic of levitated optomechanics, uh, which is also connected to the foundations of quantum physics, and he gives great lectures, so we're looking forward to his lecture. Thank you very much. So good morning, everybody. So it's time we sitting at the blackboard and with our microphone. Maybe the students in the last room uh, just want to come closer. So I'll be giving uh, three lectures, uh, two today and one tomorrow. And uh, this will be a tutorial uh, related to meditated mechanics. In particular, I plan to do the following. The first lecture is going to be an introduction. Uh, levitated quantum of the mechanics. Okay. And I'll be discussing the similarities and differences between uh, the electric nanospheres and a single atom. So, basically, out of the circuit of sphere. Lecture two will be <coughs> about Unavoidable sources of disagreements and heating in this scenario, in this levitated uh, nanosphere. Disagreements in levitated uh, nanosphere. And the third part of the lectures will be devoted then to study the. Sorry, sir, can you use the microphone? Yes, okay, sir. for the recording. Yeah, it's okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, perfect. Thanks. And the third one will be uh, <coughs> on studying just uh, wave packet dynamics, as we study in uh, the first courses of quantum mechanics, but now looking at the interplay between the coherent dynamics and the uh, dynamics in the presence of decoherence. And this is, of course, related to the fact that uh, wave packet dynamics is a way to expand the wave function of the center of mass of this nanomechanical system and at aims at the possibility of preparing really large uh, uh, quantum superpositions for these massive objects. Okay? So, wave packet dynamics, uh, coherence versus decoherence. So let's start then today with the, the first one, okay? And um, please, let's make it very informal. So any question, anything you don't understand or anything you're very interested in and you would like to, to hear more, please let me know. We can have these lectures as a, an informal discussion among all of us. So please feel completely free to interrupt and uh, ask whatever you want. Okay, so let me <clears throat> first try to motivate you why some people think uh, levitated uh, nanospheres are interesting for optomechanics and nanomechanical and nanomechanics in general. Okay, 
So the idea <coughs> of, uh, of what we want to do here is now, as you have seen already in some of the lectures, most of the nanomechanical systems are always clamped to uh, some substrate. And here now, the scenario is completely different. We want to consider this nanomechanical system to be unclamped, to be really levitating, ideally in high vacuum. Okay? And the, the, uh, the easiest shape to, to think about it is just to have a sphere that is just in high vacuum. So why is this interesting, this scenario? Well, we will see that uh, in the field of cavity optomechanics, This is interesting because first, uh, by the uh, very same scenario, as I said before, there will be no clamping losses. The degree of freedom that we want to bring and control in the quantum regime, namely the center of mass of this uh, sphere, will be in principle unclamped from uh, the mechanical path of other modes because it is levitating. One could think, well, you're uh, you, you want to bring and control to the quantum regime the center of mass of a big object. So still the center of mass could, could be coupled to all the internal uh, vibrations inside the sphere. But something that will be crucial is that this sphere is so small that these internal uh, vibrations have very, very high frequencies. Okay? Actually, they have frequencies of the order of the speed of sound divided the size of the object. And for objects of the size of 100 nanometers, these frequencies are uh, rapidly to, to the regime of 10 to the 10, 10 to the 11 hertz. This means that the center of mass, which will be typically at megahertz, is completely of resonantly coupled to the internal vibration. So effectively, this is completely decoupled. Okay? And this reason is also what, what also brings another, another, uh, another feature, which is that uh, this, non, this center of mass degree of freedom is decoupled to internal uh, defects. Okay? So, which... In other nanomechanical systems, this is uh, a problem. The couple from internal defects. Because the coupling to internal defects is typically mediated by a strain. And a strain means that it is mediated by phonons. And since the center of mass is decoupled to phonons, then there is effectively no coupling between the center of mass and, all, and these potential internal defects that could create the cohesion. Okay? And these things, for instance, have already been demonstrated experimentally, as I will comment later. And last but not least, another nice property in nanomechanical systems for the field of nanomechanics is that now this, the frequency of the mechanical mode, the center of mass, is a, is, a, uh, is a variable that can be changed. Because as we will see, this mechanical frequency depends on the intensity, for instance, of the lasers that you use to trap the particles. So, and since you can just reduce the intensity, you can change the mechanical frequency. So it's a, it's, a, it's a variable that you can tune. So mechanical frequency, mechanical frequency uh, can, can be uh, modulated. Okay. Uh, in, in, in cavity or in optomechanics, these two properties of here automatically imply that in principle it should be possible to cool to the ground state the center of mass of a levitated nanosphere from room temperature. Okay? So in principle, uh, ground state cooling should be possible starting from room temperature. Okay? And indeed, there are, this has not really been demonstrated experimentally, but there are experiments in which an optically levitated nanosphere is trapped in high vacuum, and they apply feedback cooling, and they have already demonstrated cooling to a few, a few phonons, to 10, 10 phonons, between 10 and, and 20 phonons, okay, in the experiments, in the group of Lucas Novoni in ATH Zurich and Romain Kidan in uh, TICFO in Barcelona. Okay, good. Very good. So <clears throat> then another area where uh, we believe that, uh, the electric nanospheres are also interesting is in the area of matter wave interferometry.
So most likely all of you have heard about these beautiful experiments done in Vienna about sh showing matter wave interfer interference of very large molecules, like for instance the uh, Fuller N molecules containing 60 carbon atoms in the late 90s and, and even larger molecules more recently. Okay? So the idea here is always to start with a, with a massive object whose position is somehow uh, sufficiently cooled such that it, be, it behaves according to the, quantum, uh, the laws of quantum mechanics. Then you expand this uh, wave packet and then maybe you, uh, you put a double slit and then you prepare a square position state and then you see interference okay, of a massive object. And uh, one goal is to actually do these experiments with yet more and more massive objects, okay? And uh, using uh, levitated nanospheres, one uh, feature that you have is that actually you can prepare very nicely the initial state of the matter wave interferometry. Namely, you can prepare a, a, sufficient, uh, a significantly large object whose center of mass is already in the ground state by applying the, the techniques of cavity optomechanics. Okay, so <coughs> basically you are able to prepare initial pure states very nicely. <coughs> in a very controlled way, because in a very controlled way, because in matter wave interferometer experiments, typically what they do, they have an oven, and they just, create, they just you know, uh, emit molecules and they try to filter such that they really get very cold in one axis but this is done nicely, but, uh, but, but to go to even larger masses, you need further control. So, and this is for sure then a very nice possibility, just to trap these nanospheres, cool the center of mass close to the quantum regime, and then switch off the trap and let the particle fall to a matter wave interferometry. And actually in the group of Marcus Arn in the, in the, in the University of Vienna, uh, they are actually very interested in this direction. The second one, is that you could also think to use then what we know and what we learn from optomechanics, namely to control these degrees of this center of mass degree of freedom to actually manipulate the wave, to maybe be able to expand the wave faster, to uh, break it into two state, into a superposition state, and so on. So we can use actually the, the, proper, the, the tools of nanomechanics to uh, control the matter waves, okay? Good. <coughs> Another area where these nanospheres might be interesting is for sensing. Okay, uh, and this is of course uh, an area where basically almost all nanomechanical systems are very interesting because they are massive and they can be used for sensing. And once they bring them to the quantum regime, they are very fragile to the environment, so the environment can already imprint a feature that can be read out from the nanomechanical system. What is a bit peculiar uh, for the levitating scenario <coughs> is <coughs> that, or, or a nice property that all nanomechanical systems have, is that uh, the object, by definition, since it's a solid, has a high mass density. Okay. And why, why is this interesting? For instance, uh, a very fundamental uh, question is to measure uh, gravity at very short distances. Because there are many theories that predict that the Newton's law uh, might be not correct at very short distances. So at very short distances, the gravity could be much, much stronger than what is given by the Newton's law. Okay? And actually, it's very interesting to know that, for instance, uh, at the range of few micrometers or below uh, even below one micrometer, actually gravity has almost not been measured. So we don't know whether at these distances uh, gravity is described by the Newton's law or it's much stronger. Okay? So to be able to measure that, then you would like to put a sufficiently massive object close to another one. And, and in this sense, one strategy was always to say, okay, I have a surface, and then I put a gas of atoms. Okay? which are nicely isolated from the environment, I place it close to the surface, and I try to measure the interaction between the surface and the cloud of gases, the cloud of atoms. Of course, it's much more interesting 
if we can increase the mass density such that all this mass that is distributed over a large cloud now is placed onto a very, very tiny volume of a nanosphere. Okay? The same mass is now concentrated on a very small volume of 100 nanometers. Typically, a cloud of, uh, cloud of, uh, of atoms uh, occupies a size of a few micrometers or even more. Okay? So now you have a very high mass density. So this is like a point source of a gravitational field, which now you can place close to another source and try to measure gravity at short distances. And of course, here the levitation would help in the sense that the system is better isolated from the environment, but, but not necessarily. Okay. Another interesting aspect of this is that having such a point source uh, to be that small, it's beneficial because you could consider that the mass density is homogeneous. And this is interesting because of the following. So again, related to gravity. Uh, you might know that the worst, so the, uh, so the, the big G, and, uh, a constant in, 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 in nature, a very important one, is actually quite badly measured. Okay? This is uh, the, 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 the worst uh, constant of nature uh, measured because uh, it has been measured to four digits, which is maybe not that bad. But the, pro the problem is that this measurement doesn't agree between different experiments, okay? Because there are systematic errors that cannot be controlled. The measurements are sensitive, but not accurate, okay? And this is actually an, a, a very important open question in the, in the field. And one of the reasons, why a very strong systematic that they have is that to measure big G, they need to use very large masses, okay? And then these large masses, uh, it's, so, and in these large masses, to measure big G very accurately, you need to know where the center of mass of this big mass is, okay? And this is very difficult to know because there might be some systematic errors, like, for instance, inhomogeneities in the mass density that already gives you some uncertainty where the center of mass of this big mass is. So, in this sense, having a point source, a very, very small uh, source of, of gravity, like a nanosphere, it's actually... Might, might be beneficial in terms of locating where the center of, of mass of this source of gravity is, okay? And for instance, this is a topic that the group of Marcus Aspelmeyer also in Vienna is very interested in, okay? <clears throat> and then, um, yeah. <clears throat> and these things that I explained here for masses, uh, for, uh, related to the mass, that would be if you want to use the spheres as a source of gravitational fields. But other type of spheres might, have, might be sources of other fields, like as sources of electrostatic fields, if they contain charges, or sources of magnetic field, if they are magnetized. And then the same things would apply there. Okay? The same thing would be beneficial in this scenario too. So if you have, for instance, the particle to be charged, you could use it as a very, very good electrostatic field sensor, and there have been recent experiments also in the group of Lucas Novotny. Or if the particle is magnetized, maybe you can also use it as a very nice magnetic sensor, which is very small and very sensitive. Okay? Good. And uh, if you want to also extrapolate in the long term, if we were able at some point to prepare really large uh, superposition states of these nanospheres, imagine you are able to prepare a, na a state in which the nanosphere is in two, the local, in two different positions, okay, left and right, where these two positions are separated by a distance larger than the, cent than the size of the particle. In quantum optics, you could consider that this is kind of a noon state for measuring forces that are proportional to the mass, such as gravity. Okay, this would be like a noon state. A noon state. You, maybe you remember in quantum optics, a very sensitive measurement is to, is to, in an interferometer, to prepare a state where all the photons are either on one arm of the interferometer and on the other one in a superposition fashion. Okay, and, this, and these measurements are very sensitive. Uh, and these states are very sensitive if in one arm of the interferometry there is a phase imprinted. Okay? So if we would do now the same, imagine you have a source of gravity. And now you prepare a superposition state 
where I have two different positions, one very close to the gravitational source and one very far, and you are able then to prepare the superposition state and measure the interference pattern downstream, this would, would be a very, very sensitive measurement to measure gravity, provided, uh, of course, these states uh, are free from decoherence or decoherence doesn't scale also with the superposition side and so on. So one always has, has to be a bit careful. But in principle, that would also be possible. Good. <clears throat> then uh, another area. where nanospheres might be interesting is in the field of nanophysics. So, so far, I've been telling you that one possibility is to have this object at the nanoscale, really nicely isolated from the environment. And for these uh, applications that I commented before, we are interested just in one degree of freedom, for instance, the center of mass, OK? The position of the center of mass and how it behaves and so on. But now you can also think, OK, I have a, a piece of uh, matter which has a size of maybe 100 nanometers, and now and this piece of matter is really well isolated from the environment. So now what I can do is I can look inside what happens inside this object. Okay, and what are the physics that happen inside this object? In, the, in, the, in a very uh, peculiar uh, scenario, which is that this piece of matter is actually isolated from the environment. It's not on a substrate. Okay? And this, uh, of course, <laughs> it's, it's a very interesting uh, scenario, in particular when the object is very rich. So for instance, something we are very interested in is to consider this object to be a, 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 a nanomagnet, a single domain magnetic nanoparticle. Then suddenly you have a, a magnetic domain that is isolated from the environment, and now you can look very nicely at what happens inside. What are the physics of, of nanomagnetism inside the object? How this physics couple to the center of mass, to the rotation, and so on. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. You could also think about, for instance, already in the experiments uh, of Lucas Novonia and Comen Kidan, they have an optically levitated nanosphere, as I will describe later, and they have the following scenario. This object is in vacuum and is inside a lab that has a temperature, it has a room temperature. Okay? The center of mass, they are able to cool it to a few phonons. So the center of mass is, let's say, at, at the millikelvin regime. And the bulk temperature, if you look at the temperature of all the other internal vibrational modes, it, it is super hot. The bulk is actually, they have measured to be above 1,000 kelvins. Okay? So, and this, this difference in temperature, center of mass being much, much cooler than the bulk, is a consequence of the fact that I told you that the center of mass is decoupled from internal vibrations. This has been measured. But this scenario also opens uh, interesting questions. You have now a system completely out of equilibrium, of thermal equilibrium, so uh, in vacuum. And now you could study things as, for instance, how the uh, system thermalizes, how it exchanges heat with, for instance, another particle that is in the vicinity of this one, and so on. So you could also look at this type of physics, uh, what is called radiative heat transfer, the heat, radiative heat transfer with sources of heat which are finite. So its temperature can also change as a function of time, it's out of equilibrium, and so on. Okay? This is, I think, also a very interesting direction. And the last point I would like to uh, comment, as Florian was motivating in the very beginning, is that, of course, these scenarios are, might also be interesting for the quantum foundations, of, or for the fund foundations of quantum mechanics. And the reason is the following. So imagine I consider a, a rigid body. Uh, so I, I consider a solid. And this solid has some mass density, rho, and some radius r. So the mass of this object is, is, is basically scales with the mass density and the volume. 
And now imagine I'm, I'm able to actually prepare a superposition state of the center of mass such that this uh, rigid, uh, this solid is now preparing a superposition state where its center of mass is delocalized over a distance uh, d, okay? Then now you could think uh, about the following plot. You would like to be able to prepare superposition states of objects of radius r and in, uh, in a superposition state where the center of mass is delocalized over a distance d. Okay? And this then forms a parameter space. <coughs> so far, experiments that have been done either use uh, small, uh, small masses and, su and very large superposition states, for instance, something like that. Imagine these distances here I put the R. Okay. And this, for an example of that, there have been these amazing experiments at Stanford where a single atom <coughs> is preparing a superposition state of half a meter. Okay. Where an, an atom is the localized over half a meter. Okay. <coughs> so there are this parameter regime is very nicely explored. Then the field of nanomechanics aims at exploring this parameter regime here. Okay, where I have very, very large massive objects of billions and billions of atoms, but the delocalization of the center of mass has a length, uh, has a length given by the zero point motion, which as you know, then D would be of the order of the zero point motion. Uh, once you put numbers into that, this uh, delocalization distance is typically smaller than the size of a single atom. It's easily at the 10 to the minus 12 meters and so on. So you have a, a very, very large massive object whose center of mass is delocalized over very tiny distances, smaller than the, the size of, a, of an atom. Okay? So if you want here, there are then the matter wave interferometer experiments with atoms and uh, small mass molecules. And here we have the nanomechanical, nanomechanical systems. Okay. Then uh, one could ask, okay, so this we have tested quantum mechanics in this area, but what happens here? Okay. What happens? Is this allowed by quantum mechanics? Of course, yes. In principle, why why it should not be allowed? But there are some people that, from many many decades, have already or have conjectured that perhaps quantum mechanics breaks down once you have a very large mass that is delocalized over a very large distance. Okay, and the typical name that always appears is uh, Roger Penrose, but there are many other people actually here in Trieste, like uh, Professor Girardi, who already in the 80s also proposed models beyond quantum mechanics that would predict that quantum mechanics is perfectly okay in this regime, but is completely different in this regime. Okay? And these are conjectures that cannot be derived from first principles, but give a very clear prediction. It tells you, okay, if I prepare a superposition, a superposition state here, even in the absence of, of the coherence, this guy will not exist. Or you will not be able to prepare it. It will have a very short lifetime because of some mechanism that we don't know, but they give a prediction. So therefore, many people find very interesting to actually do experiments in that regime to explore quantum mechanics, whether it works, and to falsify these conjectures. Okay? And in this sense, uh, levitating uh, particles uh, is, a, is, a, is maybe a good scenario to explore this regime because I can, I can be here, I can have very large masses that I can cool to the ground state and prepare, and prepare already a quantum state. But then, by the fact that I can switch off the, mechanic, uh, the trap, and I can let the wave packet expand, I can go from this to this, okay, in that direction. And this is a unique uh, feature that these levitated particles have because I can switch off the, the mechanical oscillator. If I have a clamped oscillator, I cool to the ground state. I have a very nice, super, uh, a very nice quantum state. But then, if I want to have this motion delocalized over very large distances, it's going to be difficult because it's clamped and this creates the coherence, allowing this particle to fall in vacuum in the absence of fields and so. Perhaps uh, help you to do that. Okay, good. That was a long introduction motivation. I hope you feel a bit motivated now to hear the rest of the lectures. Do you have questions about that? Okay. Uh, some further, uh, 
saying that first thing is B or other than other than Sure, yeah. Well, it's a different approaches. So, so of course, there are many people that thought for many years uh, with this uh, clamp a scenario how to prepare uh, superposition states first, which is not easy because uh, you need interactions which are nonlinear. You need nonlinearity, sources of non-Gaussian states to prepare superpositions, and then you could think about expand. But uh, it's going to be difficult because you have an, uh, because the system is clamped. There is always the coupling to the thermal bath, and this is, is a limiting factor. The main advantage or the main difference in the levitating scenario is that you don't have this source of the coherence. There might be other problems, but at least this one you don't have. Yeah, it's difficult to say. But, uh, yeah. Good. Okay, so now let us concentrate on the <clears throat> on the optical scenario of, of levitated particles. So we will consider particles made of glass, made of silica, which are optically trapped using lasers and placed inside an optical cavity, okay, to do cavity quantum optomechanics. Other scenarios could also be considered, such as magnetic levitation, of either superconducting microspheres or magnets. And then typically you couple them to either spin qubits or, uh, uh, or, uh, or microwave cavities that, for instance, have a frequency that depends on the flux that is applied to this, to this cavity. This could also be explained, but today we will focus on the optical scenario. And the first thing to do is actually to discuss about the, what is called the optical dipole force. <coughs> okay. So, as I said before, we will consider an object that it's polarizable. Okay? It can be electri electrically polarized. And then we will consider this object to be uh, in the presence of an external electromagnetic field, typically a uh, uh, focused uh, laser beam, okay? And we will describe the forces that this beam e uh, exert into this polarizable object, and we will see in a second that this, for instance, creates a trap. Okay. We'll create an harmonic trap typically in the three dimensions, okay? <coughs> so the important thing is this guy is a polarizable object. Okay. <coughs> yeah. So, and then, so the idea is we have this polarizable object in the presence of an electromagnetic field. And we will define the following. So consider uh, we define the time average electromagnetic field. Okay. Okay. So I take the electromagnetic field, which is a field as a, that depends on position and time. I take its modulus square, and I take the time average. Okay. So this is a time average quantity. Okay? This is time average. Okay. <coughs> then if this if such an electromagnetic field interacts with a, a small polarizable object, then uh, that and, and this the relevant wavelength of this electromagnetic field is much larger than the polarizable object, then it is known that this object will feel a force, okay? And the force typically has, has the same, uh, the following form, okay? okay. 
and, and this, so the force is basically proportional to the gradient of E square. And of course, E square has to do with the intensity of this, let's call it laser beam from now on. Okay? And the constant of proportionality is going to be super important, alpha. And this is the real part of the polarizability of the polarizable object. Okay? So alpha is the real part, is the real part of the polarizability. Okay. And this parameter uh, is going to be a crucial parameter in cavity optomechanics for these uh, polarizable objects. Okay. And this again assumes that the wavelength of this electro the relevant wavelength of this electromagnetic field is actually larger than the size of the polarizable object. Okay, so if you have a sphere, then that's much larger. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm defining now here just the relevant part. Uh, so the relevant, the, the case in which, for instance, the particle is completely reflective. It doesn't absorb light. So then there is a still a force that is related just to the real part of the polarizability, and this is the optical dipole force. The imaginary part of the polarizability enters into what is called the gradient force, uh, but we will not assume that. So imagine that uh, the field has a phase that does not depend on the position. Then the only force that exists is the optical dipole force. Yeah? So this is the optical dipole force. <clears throat> Good. And now what I will do in the, is to characterize. So well, first of all, let us discuss now what is the value of this polarizability. For a, for a dielectric sphere, for a dielectric sphere of radius r of radius r which is much smaller than the wavelength smaller than the wavelength well And for low intensities, sufficiently low intensities, such that the, polariz the polarization is linear with electric field, then it can be shown that the polarizability, in this case, is given by the following. It's given by 3 times epsilon 0, so the vacuum permeability, the volume of the particle, the refraction index squared minus 1 divided refraction index squared plus 1. And of course, the refraction index is evaluated at the frequency of the, of the in that case, the laser. Okay? And this edge size, you can, you can see that it's in Jackson. Um, <coughs> wait a second. Yeah. This is section, you can see it in section 4.4 4 of Jackson. Okay. Good. So, what can we say from here already? So that for the electric nanosphere, the polarizability, there are two important features I want to tell you. First, the polarizability of the electric nanosphere is always positive. It's a positive constant. And that this positive has already a very important consequence, because if I look at the force, it, tell, it tells me that this, the electric nanosphere will feel a force that is pointing to the direction where the electromagnetic, the intensity of the field uh, grows. Okay? So the particle wants to go to the maximum of the intensity. Okay? <coughs> and, uh, and therefore, if you go and Google now optical tweezers, or you go to YouTube, you will see all these videos where they focus a light beam, and then they see that the electric objects trip, go to the maximum of the laser. Of the hot, they go to the hot spot. Okay? That's because the polarizability is positive. Second feature, which is also, also very, very important for nanomechanics, is that the polarizability scales with the volume of the particle. Okay? This is going to be important, very, very important later, as I will, as I will comment further. Good. 
Now, <coughs> let us try to do the same, but not for the dielectric nanosphere, but just uh, for a two-level atom. Okay. So a neutral atom, uh, you might know, it can be trapped also with light, can be manipulated with light. So, uh, or if you want, a neutral atom is also an object, a polarizable object. It's an object that can be polarized. Have a dielectric sphere, and now let us discuss um, for the atom case. Okay, so for a two level for a two level atom, okay, the simplest model. So basically, what we assume is we have an atom which is neutral and has some electronic structure. And from this electronic structure, there are two eigenstates, which are nicely separated from the others. Okay, And these two states, I call them ground and excited, as always. And this forms an atom. And this has a frequency which is given by omega 0, this transition frequency. And then I take this atom, and then now I send light Okay, that has a frequency omega, like the one before. So I want to place now this atom inside the optical tracer. Okay, <clears throat> then uh, there are some important parameters that enter always when you want to describe the interaction of a two-level system with, uh, with a laser beam of frequency omega. The first important parameter is what is called the spontaneous emission rate. So as you all know, in the absence of laser or in the absence of external fields, if you have an atom that is excited, at some point will decay to the ground state. And there is a rate uh, for which that happens. And this is a rate you should always remember, OK? At least the scaling, because it's very important. It's called the spontaneous emission rate. And what you should know is that this spontaneous emission rate at least scales with the dipole moment of the transition and the transition frequency to a power of 3. And then there are some prefactors below to match the units, epsilon uh, pi h bar c squared, c to a power of cube. But the, this dependent is very important. D here, <coughs> OK, here actually, just to be precise, I'm assuming that the transition uh, between the ground and, ex and the excited state is uh, is isotropic. So okay. epsilon here is the polarization of uh, any mode that the, the the atom is interacting with. And recall that this is the dipole moment operator, which is nothing else but the sum of all the charges inside the atom times the position of this charge from the some reference frame. Okay, That's a dipole moment operator. And this, this term basically tells me how, how well these two states are coupled by an electric dipole transition. OK? Good. Then. <coughs> And then uh, recall that, for instance, this guy tells me that the probability to be in the excited state, so the time evolution of the, of the probability to be in the excited state, I call it like that. So the population to be in the excited state decays exponentially with this rate. Okay. This is, if you recall, the optical Bloch equations for a two-level system, then you always have this term here. Okay. The population in the excited state decays in this way. Good. Then there is also another parameter, which is called the dephasing, dephasing rate, which is gamma. And, uh, and this is it's related to the spontaneous emission rate, but can have an additional contribution, okay? which I call gamma c. 
and this is just the rate for which the off-diagonal terms of the density matrix decay exponentially. Okay, so basically now the, the off-diagonal terms will decay with this rate. Okay, so in the absence of any additional dephasing, at least they decay with the spontaneous emission divided by two, but they can decay faster if there is some spontaneous, so some additional dephasing. That's called, for instance, when there is an additional dephasing, that's called in quantum optics inhomogeneous broadening. Yeah? yeah. That comes from uh, when you derive the optical block equations. Um, this is just related basically to conserve also uh, that there are, that the matrix is positive, so the density matrix has to be positive, and then there are so, so constraints. So you, it cannot happen that uh, these things decay separately. Okay, so if you want to review that, uh, there is a very nice source which is available online that I strongly recommend. Uh, there is uh, the professor Daniel Steck from the University of Oregon. He has some available PDF notes on optic, quantum optics, which have like 1,000 uh, pages in PDF that he latex. He's an experimentalist that while he's learning, he was learning uh, quantum optics, he just typed everything. And this is really pedagogical with a lot of useful information. So I strongly recommend and it's available online. So Daniel Steck. And the notes, just you, you should find it easily on the internet, but uh, it's called quantum and atom optics, the notes. And you can review all of these things, OK? Good. <coughs> Good. Then there is the defacing rate, which is related to the spontaneous emission rate. As I said, this is a very important parameter to remember. Then there is a parameter that tells me how well this two-level system couples to, for instance, a laser beam omega. And this is called the radi frequency the radio oscillation frequency. Okay. And um, in the way I define things, I define it like that. So this is just related to the dipole moment times the field, the time average field divided h bar. The more important thing, this is just dipole moment times the intensity of the field, E0. Just for the definition, let me define this guy here that I defined before as E0 squared. Okay? E0 squared, that's the time average field. Right? And I don't put the arrow to indicate that was a vector. Okay? That's just the definition, E0 squared. And this is the E0 that appears here. Okay? So and this tells me how strong is the coupling between the two-level system and this external field? Good? Okay. Then with these parameters, I can redefine another parameter that is going to be also, that is as important as the spontaneous emission rate. That is called the saturation parameter. So the saturation parameter is a dimensionless uh, parameter that is defined as the Rabi frequency <coughs> just don't want to make any typo. Okay. And gamma is omega minus omega zero. This parameter is dimensionless and depends on the Rabi frequency, the spontaneous emission rate, and the detuning. And the detuning means that the difference between the frequency of the laser and the transition frequency. Okay? And this is a dimensionless parameter. It doesn't have units. <coughs> and for instance, 
And, and in quantum optics, with this parameter and the spontaneous emission rate, you basically almost can describe everything. So for instance, I asked you a question. So imagine I have this two-level system, okay? And now I shine light omega, uh, at frequency omega. And therefore, the atom, with some probability, gets excited. And so in the steady state, what is the probability to find the atom excited? Do you remember? Can you make sure that in the steady state this is 100% excited or not? What is the limit? Half. OK, but more precisely, the limit in the steady state is actually uh, is, uh, one half of S divided S plus 1, where S is the saturation parameter. That's why it's called saturation parameter. Okay, so only in the limit where the saturation goes to infinity, you get the asymptote. But if the saturation parameter is smaller than one, actually the probability is even smaller than one. Okay, and this makes sense. You see, the saturation parameter is proportional to the Rabi frequency that I said before is proportional to the intensity of the field. So if I, if I increase the intensity a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, in principle, I, I would saturate the transition, and I would do that more effectively if I'm on resonance, for instance, if the detuning is not very large. Because if the detuning is very large, then, of course, I, for the same intensity, I also decrease the saturation, I increase the probability to be in the excited state. Okay? But this is just an example. Good. So, why I define it all of this is <coughs> because assuming, now, under the assumption, assuming that um, that the transition, that the detuning is much smaller than the transition frequency, so that the detuning is not completely crazy, so that you are not this, the frequency of the laser is close to the resonance. You know that is not very very far from the resonance. Okay, so that in quantum optics this means you can do the rotating wave approximation, <coughs> and you can also do what is called the Born the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, which means uh, which means that the motion of the atom inside uh, the presence of the electromagnetic field is actually sufficiently small such that the internal structure is always in the steady state. So the time that I need for the two levels to go to the steady state is much, much faster than the scale at which the atom moves. Okay, that's the Born-Oppenheimer approximation. If these two conditions are fulfilled, then this object, this atom, feels a force, that we call it optical dipole force, that can be written in the same way as before. So namely, it can be written again as a force. That is of this form, it's the gradient of E0 It, it has exactly the same form as the, the, the other case for the electric nanosphere. But of course, now we have to tell what is the polarizability of this two-level atom. And the polarizability in the most general form as I've uh, defined things. Can you read here when I write here, the last row? You, and, uh, because that's an important one, so I'll, I'll write it on the other side. So in that case, the polarizability of this two-level atom can be written like that, minus two times the detuning. Uh, let me write it. That's the most general form, OK? Um, OK, it depends only on the parameters I define, the detuning, the dipole moment, the spontaneous emission, the saturation parameter, uh, and the total dephasing. Okay. And for instance, let's make an assumption 
assume a far off resonance and sufficiently uh, and not extremely strong driving, so not very, very strong uh, fields, such that the saturation parameter is actually much smaller than one. Okay, so if I'm if the detuning is much larger than the dephasing, and, the, and this is not extremely strong, once you play, put numbers, you always see that the saturation parameter is much smaller than one. So let's assume that S much smaller than one. And also, <coughs> let us assume, um, so if this is the case, the saturation parameter, then it's just given by, by, by this ratio. So Rabi frequency squared divided the tuning squared plus a prefactor that is the dephasing over the spontaneous emission rate. Okay, that's for, for large detuning. And now let's also assume that you have a clean two-level system. Namely, there is no additional dephasing than the one produced by the spontaneous emission. So let's assume that uh, gamma C is equal to zero. So there is no inhomogeneous broadening. Namely, that the total dephasing is just a spontaneous emission divided by two. Okay, and then that's also the cleanest or the simplified form, or the simplified expression of the saturation parameter, which is also worth remembering, just Rabi frequency divided the tuning squared with a, with a factor. If this is the case, S much smaller than one, okay, so this guy disappears, S is much smaller than one, and as I write like that, I can also simplify the polarizability to be minus the tuning D squared And this guy is it just simplifies to to this, mm -hmm. which is also a very nice expression. So it's good to remember that the polarizability of a two-level atom far off resonance is just d square divided h bar the tuning. Okay, the dipole moment square divided h bar the tuning. Okay. <coughs> Good. So some comments. First of all, the polarizability now, uh, it's not always positive. It can be either positive or negative, and this depends on the sign of the detuning. Okay? Whereas for the electric nanosphere, the, the polarizability was always positive. And as I said, this means that now atoms can feel, they can feel attracted to the maximum of intensity or to the minimum of intensity. And this depends on the size of the, on the sign of the detuning. So if uh, you are uh, a red detune, so if the detuning is smaller, namely the, fre the, the frequency of the photons that come to the two-level atom has a frequency that is below the transition frequency, okay? They are low frequency compared to the transition uh, level. The detuning is negative. This means uh, the atom feels attracted to the maximum of intensity, okay? So this is called red detune. If the detuning is positive, namely, and of course this depends, don't remember positive or negative because this depends on your definition of the detuning. So what is it good to remember is that if the photons of the laser have a frequency below the transition frequency, then the two-level atom wants to go to the maximum. Okay? And in the other case, they want to go away from the maximum of intensity. So if you are blue detuned, then the atom actually is repelled from the maximum of intensity. Okay, this is blue detuned. That's a very important difference as compared to the nanospheres. <coughs> Interestingly, I can, I can re rewrite this polarizability now in another way. So you see this is proportional to D squared. And I told you before that this, that this, that the d square is is basically proportional to the spontaneous emission rate, right? I told you. Remember that the spontaneous emission rate scales with d square and the transition frequency to a power of three, right? The transition frequency I can write now as a wavelength, the wavelength associated to the transition frequency. Okay, let's do that. So if I, you see, if I write now d square. I uh, remember that this, this, this square can be written like that.
Okay, I can write this square using the spontaneous emission rate in this way. And now let me define this guy as uh, as uh, <coughs> as two pi over the wavelength of the transition frequency. And this guy can be written as proportional to the spontaneous emission rate <coughs> and this. Okay. So I just rewrite it like that so that the polarizability of the two-level atom for the far of resonance case then can be written like this. Why, why, I mean, I just rewrote this guy. Instead of writing in terms of d square, I, I write it in terms of the spontaneous emission rate. And I write the transition frequency of the two-level atom in terms of the wavelength. And then I get this expression. And why is this, uh, this, this expression interesting? Because now, recall, this ex or compare this expression with the polarizability of a dielectric nanosphere. I said before that for a sphere, I have three epsilon null the volume, and refraction index minus 1, refraction index plus 2. OK? So the unit should coincide. I have an epsilon 0. I have an epsilon 0. And then I need a volume scale. So here is the volume of the sphere, whereas here is the optical wavelength to a power of 3. That's a volume. So the units are correct. And, uh, and it's actually pretty similar. OK? <coughs> Indeed, note that based on this analogy, you could say, and it's actually very, very fair to say, that uh, two level, a single two level atom with a transition that is close to the frequency of the laser behaves, behaves as a dielectric sphere of size lambda zero. Okay? So even if you have a single atom, from it gets polarized so much or similar to a sphere of size uh, of radius lambda zero, and recall that lambda can be uh, lambda zero can be an optical frequency. So this this two level, th therefore, this would be at the scale of a micrometer. Okay, so this means that being close to a transition frequency in the two level system uh, boosts the polarization of a single atom to be similar to a sphere of almost a micrometer that contains billions of atoms. Okay, indeed, it is very illustrative to compare the ratio between the two polarizabilities. Let's do that. So let's compare the polarizability of uh, the two-level system and the sphere. So if I take the ratio, I exactly get the following. Okay. <clears throat> and now, for instance, let's Let's put some numbers to get the scale of this uh, of this ratio. For instance, assume a sphere with a refraction index of, let's say, two of the order of two, like silica. Uh, consider that the transition frequency, so the laser, the frequency of the laser is detuned from the transition frequency by a, by a, by an amount of hundred times the spontaneous emission rate, which is quite okay. And consider the transition frequency wavelength to be 10 times the radius of a nanosphere. Say, if I have a nanosphere of 100 nanometers, I automatically get here um, around a half a micrometer. Or if, I, sorry, if I have a, a sphere of uh, yeah, 50 nanometers radius, then this would be one micron. Okay, which is reasonable. <coughs> then if I plug these numbers, 
into that expression, I automatically get that the polarizability of a two-level system compared to the polarizability of such a sphere is 20%. Which is a very large number if you compare, the f oh, if you recall that this nanosphere of 50 nanometers radius will contain of the order of 10 to the 7, 10 to the 8 atoms. Okay? So, what does this mean? That in, in glass, since you are very, and if you shine glass with uh, optical frequency, you are very far from any, from any resonance. So, all the atoms inside the glass get very, very, light, uh, very little polarized as compared to a single one that would be somehow close to the transition frequency. Okay? So the polarizability per atom in glass is much, much smaller than the polarizability of an atom that has a transition frequency close to the frequency of the laser. That somehow makes sense. But still, the number is very, very amazing. And that's the reason why, actually, for instance, Clemens Hamara some years ago uh, had a very nice proposal where he showed that actually a membrane uh, can be coupled. So, um, so if you place in a cavity a membrane and a single atom, the atom and the membrane can be strongly coupled by the cavity because actually both objects are almost equally polarizable. Or that's also the reason why Philip Troiland in Basel is doing this beautiful experiment where it also couples cold atoms to uh, nanomechanical systems. Okay? Because the polarizability of this Tiny atoms is actually not that small. Good. Qu ah, that's the opposite. Ah, no, 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 that's okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Because in the very beginning. Ah, maybe. Did I, did I make a typo? Yeah. So I made a table, yeah, yeah. So it should be, and so the polarizability of the nanosphere is what I wrote here. Yeah, sorry about this. Yeah, and again, recall that that's a refraction index at the frequency of the laser. The refraction index, of course, changes. It's a, it's a function of the frequency. So that's the refraction index at the frequency of the incoming beam. Okay. Good. Questions about that? Okay. So now we will proceed, and I will now describe the optomechanics of this object, of this polarizable object, and you will see that basically what enters always is the polarizability parameter. And therefore, the discussion, you can apply it to a single atom or to a nanosphere. You just need to change the value of the polarizability. Okay? Good. Uh, before we do that, just one comment. So note that I said that the optical dipole force can be written like this. The gradient of E0 squared. Okay. And then <coughs> provided, provided the polarizability does not depend on the intensity of the laser, okay, which is the case for a dielectric nanosphere, sorry, for a dielectric nanosphere at sufficiently low intensity, such that the polarization is proportional to the electric field, so it's linear with electric field, then the polarizability is independent on the electric field. Or for an atom that is sufficiently far off resonance, such that the saturation parameter is smaller than one, because otherwise, note that if the saturation is not much smaller than one, this guy depends on the Rabi coupling, and the saturation, and the saturation also depends on the Rabi coupling, and the Rabi coupling depends on the intensity of the laser. Okay, so actually the polarizability of a two-level atom is only uh, independent from the field at either when it is of resonance and at sufficiently low intensities. Otherwise, this will depend on the intensity of the field. Okay, but in that scenario, no, that's important. So when this is the case, of course, then I can write an energy associated to this force, then this is, uh, I can easily integrate this uh, force and get an interaction energy, which has the form, and the interaction energy I can easily, so, so for alpha uh, independent 
of the electric field. So for a linear, for a linear polarizable object, then I can easily integrate and get this guy. Okay, and this is then just the form of the interaction energy between the field and the polarizable object. Okay, this is, this is also very important. Good. Okay, and let's move on. Okay, so now we talk about, uh, after having discussed about the optical dipole force, now we can finally start discussing about optomechanics. And in particular, we will talk about what is called dispersive uh, cavity quantum optomechanics. Good. So, the scenario we have is the following. We assume there is a, a high finesse optical cavity. Okay? And then we place this polarizable object inside the cavity. Okay? And this object could be either an electric nanosphere or a neutral atom far of resonance. Then this cavity, we will assume, has a, a very well defined single mode in the cavity that we write like this. Okay? And this is going to be what I call and this has this mode has a frequency omega c from the cavity, okay then I assume this cavity is driven externally from some uh, laser uh, some beam that has a frequency omega okay then I also assume that this particle is placed inside inside the cavity because there is some t t optical tweezer that is trapping the particle. So, and this is this external one. Okay. And this will create a potential into the particle of frequency omega t, mechanical frequency omega t, which I will show in a second. And then, then what can happen is that uh, we will see uh, the motion of this particle then can have some decoherence, some source of decoherence with a rate that I will call gamma m. So the motion can decohere. And also the photons can disappear, from, can be lost from the cavity with a rate uh, given by kappa. Okay, through the mirror, because the mirror is not perfect. So you can lose the photons because the mirror is not perfect. So there is some decay rate. <clears throat> and actually, this picture is the one that is happening now in some labs. As I said before, in, for instance, there are many labs. But, uh, they trap the electric nanosphere with some external optical tweezer. They place the sphere inside a high finesse optical cavity. They drive the cavity. And then they look at the physics uh, of uh, one degree of freedom. For instance, the motion of this polarizable object along the cavity axis. Okay, good. So how do we describe the optics or the quantum optics uh, here? Well, first of all, from the quantum optics point of view, um, yeah. So from here now there are uh, the electromagnetic field. Now you could describe uh, in different modes. There would be the modes. For instance, imagine there is only a single mode. There, is, there will be a single mode inside the cavity. Then there are some peculiar modes, which are the modes that you that you use to drive the cavity, and the mode that that the photon occupies if it leaks the cavity. Right? And then there are the free electromagnetic field modes, all the other ones. Okay. 
So in quantum optics, in cavity QED, the typical thing you do, the first thing you do is to trace out this, the, the, the input or output mode of the cavity. Okay? And then typically effective dynamics you already get can be described with, by a master equation, which is nothing else but just the, the Hamiltonian dynamics. Okay. Plus a term of this form. Where I've I've already sorry just okay and this is just to tell you that will be our starting point so uh, here I just have trace out the output mode okay so therefore the photons inside the cavity which are described by the creation annihilation operator a okay a daga creates a photon inside the cavity at this single cavity mode and a annihilates that photon. Then once I trace out these output modes, then I already have a, a decay channel for the photon, for the photons inside the cavity. Okay? For those that are not familiar with master equations, it's not so important. So basically, just recall this is the Schrodinger equation, just the Schrodinger equation written for density matrices. And whenever I have a, a guile of this form, okay, which always have this structure, sum operator, rho, the DAG of such an operator, that's typically a decay process. And a very nice mnemotechnic uh, strategy is to recall that the operator on the left of the density matrix is telling you the physical process that is happening. So the operator on the left is an A. This means that this guy is describing me the fact that I lose photons from the cavity. Okay? So if I would have this guy written with an A dagger here, this would mean that the process that is putting photons inside the cavity. Okay? That's always very good to remember. More technically, that's the jam operator that describe the decoherence process or the noise process. Okay, so in this case, this guy just tells me that I'm losing photons from the cavity with the rate given by the photon decay rate, which has to do with the coupling between the internal mode and the output modes if the mirror is not perfect. Okay? Good. And now this Hamiltonian should describe all the other degrees of freedom in this situation, which is the degrees of freedom inside the cavity, the cavity mode, the free electromagnetic field modes, and the center of mass mechanical mode. So let's write that. Um, then this Hamiltonian can actually be written in this form. It will contain the following parts. It will contain the term that describes the dynamics of the cavity mode, which is really simple. It's just an harmonic oscillator with frequency omega c. It will give me the motion of the particle, the, the kinetic energy of the particle, p squared divided 2 times m. It should give me, they should have a term that describes the dynamics of all the free electromagnetic modes, which I will call H free and I will define in a second. And then the, the crucial one, there should be the Hamiltonian that describes the interaction between the particle and the cavity mode and all the other electromagnetic field modes. This I call H interaction. Okay? So please interrupt me if there are things that are not defined or that you are not familiar with or you don't understand. Okay. So the free one, it's also kind of simple. This should be just the term that describes the dynamics of all the free electromagnetic field modes. And this is something that we know how to do. So we can quantize the electromagnetic field in free space, and then we just have a set of harmonic oscillators, which are defined by the following quantum numbers. A vector k that tells me the direction of the photon, and a vector epsilon that tells me the polarization of such a photon. And then I have to sum over all possible k's and all possible epsilons. So, and recall that epsilons have to be transverse to k, because the polarization is always transverse to k. And there are two possible values, one order of total and one. Okay? So then I have an integral over all k's, which is all directions and modulus of the, of the k vector of a photon, and a sum over epsilons, the two possible polarization states that are perpendicular to the, a given k. And then I just sum 
by this term. And uh, so, and this is just this term here tells me I create a photon that has momentum k and polarization epsilon. Okay, so and I have to sum over all possible states. From the technical point of view, you could say, well, but um, somehow these ones and this one and the one you trace out, they are not completely orthogonal. Okay, and that's actually true, but. From the technical point of view, this, this mode has uh, it, it, it's just one mode over an infinite. And this one is also almost one mode over an infinite amount. So I can here just double count them. And this is not a problem, OK? Not, not to get complicated about this. But this just will be all the other modes that are not included either in the cavity or this, in this particular mode that has a given Q, which is going in that direction, and a given polarization. This would be one mode from all this infinite um, uh, set here. OK? Just for those who are more theoretical. Good. So then this free is just given by that. And then the crucial one is the interaction. And the interaction, this can be, could be justified more rigorously than what I will do. But from the first section, we arrived at this expression with which told me, which is telling me that if I have a polarizable object interacting with an electromagnetic field, the interaction energy is just given by the total field at the position of the particle squared. Okay, so I can actually already, I hope you are, you feel that this should be related to that, and more rigorously you can show that it's this like that. So the interaction term is described by the following. So the interaction term, now I promote this interaction energy to a Hamiltonian. Let me write this. It's minus alpha 4. And now here will be the, the field, which can be an operator, evaluated at the position of the particle, which is also an operator, because I want to treat in the quantum regime. Yeah. Oh, of course, sorry. Thank you. This one? This one? This one? This one? Ah, OK, this has to go with that. So this is kind of the form that this term has to have, such that if you have a density matrix, that defines a state, a physical state. When it evolves in time, you want that this state goes to another physical state. More rigorously, you have to be sure this uh, a density matrix has two properties that are very important. So it has to have that the density matrix operator is positive, so that its eigenvalues are positive. So this means probabilities are always positive. And you also need that the trace of rho, that the probability is sum to 1. So it's 1. Okay. So if you would not include that term, it might be that starting from a state that fulfills these two conditions, you end up into a state that does not fulfill these conditions. Okay, so it's just a mathematical const, uh, restriction. So you need this term. And this is called the Lindblad form. Okay. And this is an anti-commutator. Okay. Good. So now what we do is that here, we now put the total electromagnetic field that this particle feels inside the cavity. And this has different contributions. The total field, it's going to be the field generated by the cavity mode, okay. the field generated by the external classical field, okay. that I put a laser with a lot of photons. And this is what I call the classical. All right, let me just follow my notes. But I use the same notation. Yeah, the classical. That I don't put ahead because I will see in a second. Oh, it's going to be just a classical field, but it's evaluated at the position of the particle 
which I described quantum mechanically. And then there is the field that would be generated by the three modes, OK? That, OK, they are in vacuum, so the mean value is 0, but its fluctuations are non-zero. So there would be the three. OK? So that's the three contributions that I have here. The cavity field, the external field, and the free electromagnetic uh, modes. Good. So <coughs> these guys can be written in the following way. So the cavity field. So the cavity field, and let's assume now the particle only moves on along one axis, x, the axis of the cavity. This is then when it's the typical if you can quantize the electromagnetic field inside two mirrors. And there is a prefactor. This would be the mode form. So usually you have a sinus. Uh, there is a prefactor here that tells me the strength of the feel of the cavity, basically. And it goes with omega c, the, the frequency of the cavity, and the cavity volume. Yeah, I write the fields and I stop for it. And, so, and, th and this is what is called the, basically the volume of the cavity, yeah, the cavity volume. And then here I the term that basically creates or annihilates a photon inside the cavity. Okay? And of course, the sinus is evaluated at the position of the particle, which is a quantum degree of freedom. That's the position where the polarizable object is. And you already see this creates a coupling between photons and mechanics. Okay? Then there is the, the, the free. Uh, which just have a sum over all the free electromagnetic modes. Is this guy here? There is a prefact. So again, I sum over all possible external modes, over all k's and all epsilons. But the important thing is this guy. So this guy, what it does is, you see, this is the process in which basically you can think the particle would scatter or, or uh, okay, would absorb a photon of um, momentum k and, epsi and, and polarization epsilon. And because of this scattering event, the particle feels a kick. Because recall that this in quantum me or mechanics is a momentum kick, an exponential of an operator that is x, i times x is a momentum kick. So it changes the momentum of the particle. That's a recoil kick, OK? That can have one direction on the other, depending on whether I have an a or a data. OK? So this will create a coupling between the motion, the mechanical motion, and the free electromagnetic modes. And the last term, it's going to be the classical one, which uh, yeah, I, I will come in a, in a second. I will do that in the next lecture. But the classical one is just an external field that describes the tweezers. Okay, Good. So in the next lecture, we will see that now, actually, how these three terms, once you plug them here, actually give you the optomechanical Hamiltonian that you are familiar with. Plus, it describes also the interaction between the cavity, the cavity mode, uh, and the mecha mechanical motion, the optomechanical, and the, the coupling between the motion and external photons, which is what describes uh, recoil heating, a source of heating in the motion, and also a new channel for losing photons from the cavity, because now a photon from the cavity can be scattered off from the sphere outside the cavity. Okay, and we will discuss the rates and so on. This we will do in the next lecture. So thank you very much, and uh, let me know if there are any questions.